Okay, hi everybody. I'm Reina. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Jaron. Um, okay, so uh, basically my talk today, I'm going to demonstrate how R works for me and my team in production. And I'm also going to share some tips that I found very useful and helpful uh, to productize our results. Um, basically, I've been hearing a lot of claims, like in recent years, that R is supposedly not strong enough or stable enough to run in production, mostly from uh, Python guys. But um, not only that these claims are not true, and I'm going to prove it, um, actually with a very well-written R script and the help of very basic tools, R runs perfectly in production. So I'm going to start here with a little background about um, the user acquisition world, the world that I'm dealing with, uh, just to give you some context about the use cases. And then I'm going to move forward with the challenges in terms of data science, obviously. And the main part of the talk is going to focus on the solution on R. So um, you might want to refer to this as the very broad definition of user acquisition, but some will probably prefer to refer to it as like these annoying ads that you see on your social network feed. Um, you probably ask yourself, why am I targeted to play this game or to buy this thing that I don't even need, right? So uh, the answer is basically user acquisition strategy. So uh, let's say an app developer, they want to expand their community and reach new users. So their best way to go probably is social media advertising. Research have shown that this, is, this channel is probably the most favorable in terms of reach and cost effectiveness. So um, these areas on your social network feed, they cost money. Okay, and social media networks, they sell them. Mostly with uh, all types of auctions that are uh, Vickery option, auctions, if you know, um, that you place a bid, but you don't know the bid of others. So this is the cost part. And then uh, basically, the effectiveness part, how we measure how effective our ad was or how successful it was. So that here actually varies quite, quite a lot between app developers. So just to demonstrate the variation, this is the very basic user funnel. So it starts with impression. It doesn't matter that you skim through the ad really, really quick, you didn't even take a look. This is what I do. Don't take a look, but this counts as an impression. Okay, and sometimes you pay per impression, so this is important. And then the next thing, maybe you saw, like we like to define a thumb stop in creative, so you click on it, right, it looks cool. And then uh, you might even like the app behind it and install it, and then eventually you played it and you really, really like it and you wanna purchase some stuff, let's say casino chips or soldiers or life or whatever. So um, this is just a very, very basic funnel without even mentioning the costs here. Only on this part, I can create so many ratios. So I have click-through rate, right? I can know, uh, I, I can calculate how many people clicked from the people that uh, were exposed to the ad. I can have the install rate, the conversion rate, how many, what is the payers rate, how many people actually paid. Just here I have like many uh, ratios. And if I add cost into this equation, I have cost per install, cost per action, um, ROI calculations, and it varies, it goes on and on. So we have many different target variables. This is important, we're gonna talk about them later. Um, so yeah, so as for the stats, just for you to know in the app world, so out of millions of impression, millions, only like 1% click on the ad, 0.4% uh, actually installed the app behind it, and less than 0.1% actually purchase. Sounds like really bad, right? But you'd be surprised it converts into a lot of money, a lot. And um, how it converts into a lot of money or even more money? That happens only if we place a winning user acquisition strategy. And what is a, user, a winning user acquisition strategy? We want to uh, target our ad to the perfect audience at the perfect time, right? We want to target to the people that are actually going to play with it. I don't want to bother you with ads that you don't care about. I want to post my ads to the right people. And how we do that, that's a challenge. But this is where data science plays a significant role. We create many different models, not only for audience recommendation, but only also for bid suggestions and recommendation, budget allocator. We also have a model, like, it goes crazy. We have a lot of, 
a lot of suggestions that we can give to app, to app developers. Even we can have like what colors are recommended to post in creative, so it would be thumb stopping and stuff like that. So we have a lot of stuff that we can help, we can help app developers with. But unfortunately, not every app developer can actually afford a data science team. Most of them, they, don't even, they can't even afford a data scientist. Apparently, we cost a lot of money. So um, yeah, so this is what we do actually in Bidalgo. We help them. We help them with the result. We help them with all the optimization process. So one, we help them with end-to-end -end optimization. So we start with like choosing the best creative, design it for them, uh, have a color recommendation, have bid suggestions, target our recommendations. Uh, when is the best time to post the ad? When is the best time to stop the ad? All that we calculate it through models. And then the, the second part is basically automate this entire process. You'd be surprised, people actually sit in their full-time job and just like managing their ads. It's a lot of work, so we just automate this entire process. So our basically main challenge here is, let's say that I had all the time in the world, and I have, this is true, like we have hundreds of app developers. So I would like to create like a separate model for each app. So I have casino app, and I have, um, I don't know, strategy games, and I have also e-commerce, and I have a bunch of different apps. Everyone work, everything works completely different between them. Even we see cases that we have two apps from the very same developer, the very same developer that, con, that behave completely different. So like all the models are kind of like noisy, right? It's like, it's, it's a problem. So I would, ideally I would like to have a model per customer, but obviously it won't scale up, right? I won't be able to do that. So it's always the balance to find the balance to keep the model personalized, but also to keep the entire process automatic and scalable. <coughs> so we basically uh, found that if we keep our script flexible and dynamic enough, this is actually possible. Okay, and I'm gonna review the very, uh, basic concept. So this is basically how we work, like very broadly. So we have a research mode, right? We try maybe, let's say, budget allocator. So I try zillions of different models. I try to model, obviously, everything I'm, I'm working on R, obviously, um, on the studio, then I test everything. I test it on the staging, and I test it with actually clients, try to see the results. I use various tools here make sure that everything works perfectly in production after I compared all the models. Let's say that I found a model that is stable enough. Stable enough and flexible enough. So next thing is the approval of the move to production. And this talk is going to focus only on this part, okay? Or in simple words, how to ensure my R script is production ready. And here's where we get to the technical part. So uh, basically we found that these concepts are very, very useful and helpful. And I'm gonna review them one by one. But when I follow them, basically my, smooth, my, my move to production can be actually be very, very smooth. But we have to, really, to follow them and I'm gonna review them one by one. So first, we have the thing of a flexible input. So in our server we can actually set the uh, parameters in advance through, uh, the, through the server. So for example, I can have every app ID separately. So I have the entire script, let's say a model, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I have a model and I, can, and I can set, sorry. And I can set the app ID. So um, I get it as an input. The model runs for every app. Also, the model can run for every business vertical or for every country or for every platform or depends on what I'm trying to model. So I get the app ID as an input. Okay, and actually this is how it looks on the server side. Okay, so I type into the server. I don't really type, right? Everything is automatic, but, I'll, I'll, but let's say I'm gonna type it. So it's the script location and all the script parameters. So I have the script location and then I always do the first parameter whether it's production or staging and then uh, I go on with uh, the next parameter. So here I see, um, sorry. Okay, so here I see uh, we have the client ID, the app ID, the platform and the country 
and uh, it moves forward here. So the staging, app ID, uh, client ID, app ID, platform, and country. And then in the data extraction, everything is flexible. So I see here in the data extraction, this is a, just a very basic data extraction, but I can set the statement according to the app ID. So I extract data just for this specific app. So the model run only for them. Okay, um, this is just for the input, but then actually for the entire model, so I do some, something that we call dynamic scripting. So that's, uh, that part may sound like very, very straightforward and obvious, but you would be surprised how important it is because we found out that uh, the server is extremely sensitive. Um, something that works perfectly on the studio will have a lot of bugs on the server. It's like, it's surprising, but that's what happens. So like something like super basic as an A's, they just, it stopped running. It just stops running and too bad, I lose this model for this app. It's important, right? It's a client. So um, for, for example, just removal of an A's. Here I have dummy variables. I create dummy variables for my model. And this has to be dynamic as well. So here I got gender targeting. So some apps will target their uh, app for female, some for male, some for all, some for female, male, and all. And I don't want to predefine the dummy variables. So I just go gender dot, and then I get the name of the variable from, from the client's data. Okay, so uh, this is how I set it dynamically. And then the next thing, is basically like we said before, the target variable, it changes between all the apps. So this is set dynamic as well. So I get the success parameter from the flexible input, okay? I get it as a parameter of the model, and then it varies between apps. So one app is really important to them, the click-through rate, and then the other app is uh, cost per install. That's okay, I get it as a flexible input, and then I set it as a, as a parameter in the model. And after that, I obviously, again, remove an A, and then uh, I found, I find this parameter in my data, and then I know this is the predicted variable. I call it successful here. Um, next thing I do is basically, um, so every, again, it's like the data varies a lot. So one app can have 100 different explanatory variables for the model, and then another app can have only 20 or 10. It happens. So we need to keep in mind that the data length varies between the apps. And here, for example, I uh, remove unmeaningful variables. So this is also, again, something really important. So for me, like unmeaningful variable is something with a standard deviation that equals to zero here. Um, so it's been removed. Um, and then the most important part, so I keep my formula dynamic and general as possible. So I don't do the model like this is a GLM net model. So I don't do the target variable and then all the explanatory variables. I don't call them by name. Okay, I just keep my formula very, very general. Okay, and then we get to the next point of scalable structure. So if that's why we wanted to keep everything personalized and, uh, personalized and dynamic, here we do the exact opposite. Okay, we want to have everything scalable so it runs on production so I can extract the results and visualize them in the front end. It has to work the same for all clients. So uh, it has to be presented the same in, our, in my product. So here is where I created the, a very general structure for the GLM net results. So I get the results here. I call two columns, variable and estimate, right? I get uh, all the variables that are meaningful and their coefficient, their estimate. And this is where I have in my table. Obviously, I will add to this table other columns, such as uh, app ID or platform or whatever I was trying to model. And then eventually everything is written to production tables. This is cool. Um, another thing is basically we found it very, very useful to plant error messages across the script. So I see exactly where my script failed. So here, for example, I have data extraction error or I have model error. So I know exactly what happened during the process um, and I can analyze it. So this is how it looks from, um, this is how it looks from the studio side. So I plant all the uh, messages. Also, I always plant done at the end, never mind what happened in the middle. And this is how it looks on the server side. Now all these messages are actually written to a log file in the server. Okay, so we have log files with what happened to the model. 
And then, after that, I extract these log files into a table, and I can analyze this table. And actually, I present it in shiny dashboards. So I do a shiny dashboard on my model to see how successful it was. So here, I, I know, divide it to three sections, data error, model error, and success. And I know exactly what is the success rate. And if I have a problem, I also have a monitoring process that goes to Slack channel and modify and notify me whenever I have a problem. Um, yeah, and then the, the last part, but not least, is the solution architecture. So I want to have everything. So obviously, the main ingredient here is our server. But also, I have the help of different tools. So remember before when we said we have all the script input. So I generate all this input for all the different apps or all different verticals or platform or whatever using PHP. So I just have a long list of all the input that I want to give to my script. And then I schedule it using cron, because every client has a different account time zone. And I want to have full day's data, right? So it has to go from the beginning to end. So I use cron job to do that. And then it goes to the script. The script does its magic. And then it provides results, writes the results to production table. And it goes to the, server, uh, to the front end, again, with the help of PHP and cron jobs. Also, we have in the middle all kinds of other model input that I write here, and obviously the shiny dashboard, like we said before, which I track daily. OK, and so for conclusion, so we have our result in production. That is possible. Our result in production is not an issue. It's not a technical issue. OK, so and what I have with the results we have, basically, it's what I call um, kind of a seamless data science. OK, it's like. The client just get a bid recommendation. It's a number. Or they get uh, a, a, a target audience recommendation, word, gender, female. This is it. They don't know the fancy model behind it. But R is there. OK, and it works in production. The second part, that this is a personal challenge that has nothing to do with R, I think. So if I want to uh, present extensive model results, it's kind of more challenging because, let's say, a, a prediction trend or something that is a little bit more fancy. It takes time just the visualization of it and how you actually explain it to client. Most of the work here, and I won't be exaggerating by telling that, most of the work here is not modeling, is talking to marketing and product people and explain to them what happened, like the model results. So this is a, this is a challenge. Maybe R can solve that in the future. But I don't think it has anything to do with R. It has, any, it has something to do with data science in general. So um, like I said before, R in production is not an issue, and it runs perfectly for us. And if you have any question on how, how exactly we do that and how the structure works, please feel free to come to me afterwards and I'd be happy to share more detail, details. Thank you.